an advantage of expressing the uh, asymptotic notations in terms of limits uh, is that a bunch of their properties then become immediately obvious. Here's one. Um, if f is little o of g, or f is asymptotically equal to g, then in fact f is big O of g. Well, we could reason about this informally by saying that the first one means that f is much less than g, and the second one means that f is about the same as g, and the final one means that f is roughly less. So being about the same and definitely less is certainly, this uh, implies roughly less. But we can, in fact, be entirely precise just using the definitions because f equals O of g means the limit of f over g is zero, and f is asymptotically equal to g means that the limit of f over g is one, and the definition of f equals big O of g is that the limit is finite. And clearly, if it's zero or one, then it's finite. Um, another such property is that if f is much less than g, then g is not roughly less than f. More precisely, if f is little o of g, then g is not big O of f. The left-hand side says that the limit of f over g is zero, but that implies that the limit of g over f is one over zero or infinity, which means it's not finite, so g is not big O of f. Now, the usual way that big O is defined in the literature doesn't mention limits at all. And in fact, as I said, the definition really isn't a limit, it's a limb soup. And let me show you the standard definition and then explain why uh, the limb soup captures it and is needed. So the, the official definition of f is big O of g is that there's some constant multiplier, c, that you can amplify g by such that once g is amplified by the factor c, then in fact f is less than or equal to c times g. But this doesn't may not hold right at the beginning. There's a certain point, n0, after which it holds forever. Let's try to illustrate this complicated alternation of quantifiers expression with a diagram that may make it clearer. So suppose that I want to express the fact that f is big O of g, where f is a green line. So that green line is the graph of f of x, the function. And g in blue is shown. And as a matter of fact, g of x is less than or equal to f of x, but nevertheless, f is going to be little o, big O of g, because if you multiply g by a constant, it becomes, we're sort of shifting it up to be this constant times g, it becomes this purple curve, and the purple curve, it gets to be above the green curve from a certain point on, that's n0. So by raising up the blue curve g by an amount c to get it to be this purple curve, the purple curve gets above f from a certain point n0 on, and that's why f is big O of g. Now, of course, multiplying the blue curve g by a constant doesn't raise it up a fixed amount. It, it alters it. But if we imagine that our curve was a log scale, then in fact, multiplying g by uh, c is the same as adding log c on a log scale. So the picture is actually accurate if the vertical scale is logarithmic. So using this standard definition, I can explain why in the equivalent definition in terms of limit, I couldn't say limit, I needed to say lim soup. Here's what lim soup does for us. Suppose I have a function f that's say less than or equal to 2g, which means that surely f is big O of g according to the previous definition, because you amplify g by 2 and you get above f. The problem is that f of n over g of n may have no limit. So I can't simply say that f is O of g because the limit of f over g is finite. Let's see what how that could happen. Suppose that f is in fact equal to g times a number that varies between 1 and 2. Here's That's an example where um, sine of n pi over 2 varies between 0, 1, and and minus 1, and you square it, it becomes 0 or 1, and you add 1 to it, it becomes 1 or 2. So this is an expression which, as n grows, alternates between the values 1 and 2. And I'm multiplying g of n by this constant that's either, by this factor that's either 1 or 2, but the limit of f of n over g of n does not exist. It's alternating between uh, 1 and 2. 
On the other hand, the limb soup of f of n over g is 2, uh, which is finite, and therefore, according to the limb soup definition, indeed, f is O of g. Now, the technical definition of limb soup is one that you can read in the text or find in a calculus book. Um, it's basically the largest limit point of the fraction f of n over g of n, and if you don't know what a limit point is, uh, it's stuff that we don't need to go into, but I did want you to understand why formally we need limb soup. In most cases, uh, the limit exists, and we can use the simpler limit definition rather than the uh, exists a constant such that for every number n greater than or equal to n0, etc., which is a more complicated definition. Okay, let's collect a couple of more basic facts about little o uh, that, and big O that we're going to need. Namely, that if A is less than B, I don't know they can be negative numbers, I don't care, but real numbers. If A is less than B, then x to the A is little o of x to the B. The proof follows almost immediately from the definitions because to prove that x to the a is little o of x to the b, we want to look at the quotient of x to the a over x to the b. But of course, the quotient of x to the a over x to the b is equal to 1 over x to the b minus a. And since a is less than b, b minus a is positive. So that means that as x approaches infinity, the denominator uh, is x to a positive power also goes to infinity, and therefore 1 over x to that positive power goes to 0, which is the definition of x to the a being little o of x to the b. Um, another crucial fact is that logarithms grow slower than roots. So if you think of epsilon as like a half or a third, it's saying that the log of x is less than or equal to the square root, it's less than or equal to the cube root, it's less than or equal to the 50th root, doesn't matter. Okay, um, this is a proof that just falls back on elementary calculus. Um, and I guess I've highlighted it because it's definitely worth remembering logarithms grow slower than roots. Um, the proof is, begins with the immediately obvious remark that 1 over y is less than or equal to y, because they're equal when y is greater than or equal to 1. 1 over y is equal to y when y is greater than or equal to 1, and as y increases, y gets bigger and 1 over y gets smaller, so the inequality is preserved. That's easy. Okay. Well, that means that I can integrate both sides starting at 1. So if I take the integral of 1 over y from 1 to z, it's going to be less than or equal to the integral of y from 1 to z. Well, integral of 1 over y is log z, and the integral of y is uh, to z is z squared over 2. So what we get is this new inequality. The log of z is less than or equal to z squared over 2 for z greater or equal to 1. So we're on the way there. We've got log of z is less than um, z squared, but not z to any epsilon power. And, but we'll get that just by making a smart substitution for z. So that's the next step. We have that log of z is less than or equal to z squared over 2 for uh, any z greater than or equal to 1. Let's let z be the square root of x to the delta, where delta is simply some positive number. So in that case, What's the log of z? Well, the log of the square root of x to the delta, the square root means it's half of log of x to the delta, which is delta log x. So uh, log of z is delta log of x over 2. And of course, z squared is just x to the delta, so z squared over 2 is x to the delta over 2. Now, um, I can just cancel the denominators too, and I get that log of x, and then transpose the delta. Log of x is less than or equal to x to the delta over delta, but delta, as long as delta is less than epsilon, delta, x to the delta is going to be little o of x to the epsilon, which means that x to the delta times a constant, namely 1 over delta, is also going to be little o of x to the epsilon. And I've just figured out that uh, I've shown that log of x is little o of x to the epsilon as required. One more crucial fact um, that I'm going to not prove, but I'll state, is that polynomials grow slower than exponentials. This is closely related to the fact that logs grow slower than roots. Um, but in particular, if x is any if c is any constant uh, and a is greater than 1, then x to the c is little o of a to the x. And 
there's a bunch of ways to prove this using L'Hopital's rule or Maclaurin series, and I'll leave it to you to look up your 1801 calculus text to find a proof of that fact.